The late 11th century nearly saw the collapse of the Eastern Roman Empire. In 1071, after the disastrous Battle of Manzikert and a prolonged period of political infighting in Constantinople, the Seljuk Turks would do what the other Islamic powers had been attempting and failing to do for over 400 years take Anatolia, the heart of the Byzantine Empire. North of the river Danube, a new wave of nomadic invaders, the Cumans and Pechenegs, had also begun to eye the Balkan provinces of the Empire. To the west, another enemy was gathering momentum as well. Across the Adriatic, southern Italy had come under the control of new masters, the Normans. Yes, the same Normans that had conquered England in 1066. Beginning as mercenaries of the local Lombard and Byzantine counts, serving in their petty squabbles, the Normans would eventually be granted a small patch of land and enough resources to begin carving a realm of their own. The members of one certain Norman clan, the so-called Ottavios, would eventually become the new masters of southern Italy. The most influential members of this Norman clan were two brothers. Robert Giscard would subdue the Lombard princes and the last Byzantine holdings on the peninsula, and his vassal brother Roger would conquer Sicily from its Muslim overlords. Giscard, now master of one of the richest regions of the Mediterranean, would turn his aim eastwards to the rapidly declining Eastern Roman Empire. In 1081, Robert would cross the Adriatic and land near the major Byzantine stronghold of Dyrrhachium. In the meantime, a new Byzantine emperor had just overthrown the previous one, as had happened multiple times in recent years. This new ruler, however, was not like the others. His name was Alexius Komnenos, a Byzantine general and a nephew of a former emperor. Immediately upon his ascension, Alexius would raise an army and face the Normans in the vicinity of Dyrrhachium. However, the Byzantine emperor would be utterly defeated, narrowly escaping death or capture himself. However, despite his loss, Alexius would prove to have a resilient character and a shrewd political instinct. Through bribes and secret deals, the Roman Emperor spurred dissent throughout Italy and turned the Holy Roman Emperor against the Normans, forcing Robert to return to Italy. The Norman campaign was far from over though. Bohemond, the son of Giscard, would conquer a large portion of central Greece in the following years. Alexius would try to stop the Normans, but be defeated by them on two occasions. However, as mentioned prior, the Emperor was not one to give up easily. In 1083, Alexius would annihilate Bohemond near the city of Larissa forcing the Normans to run back to Italy. One can confidently say that Byzantium was saved from a Norman conquest only thanks to Alexius and his unique character. This can make us wonder what if Alexius wasn't there to save Byzantium from total collapse? What if the Byzantine Emperor died at the Battle of Dyrrhachium in 1081 and the Comnenian Restoration never took place? The death of Alexius in 1081 would have caused an immediate succession crisis in Constantinople, enabling the Normans to conquer the entirety of Greece. Seeing a perfect opportunity, the nomadic Cumans and Pechenegs would invade the provinces of Moesia and Thrace. In our timeline, Alexius cleverly turned the Cumans against the Pechenegs and annihilated the nomadic forces near the town of Enos. Without the shrewd Byzantine Emperor to stop them, the Cumans and Pechenegs would loot, plunder and effectively strip the northern provinces from Byzantine control. In the meantime, the old subdued enemy of Byzantium, Bulgaria, would see a revival. A couple of years before 1081, a Serbian prince and a descendant of the last Bulgarian emperors named Constantine Bodin spurred a rebellion in Bulgaria and proclaimed himself a Bulgarian emperor. However, his revolt was crushed and he was forced to flee back to Serbia. Now seeing a massive opportunity for rebellion, Constantine would invade once again and with the help from the local Bulgarian nobility would bring forward the establishment of a powerful Serbo-Bulgarian state. Bodin would likely eventually push the Pechenegs out of the Balkans and clash in a conflict with the Normans. Meanwhile, the Eastern Roman Empire would be limited to the single province of Thrace and several coastal regions of Anatolia which would fall one by one to the Turkish Sultanate of Rome. Byzantium would likely exist in this contracted form for a couple of decades as the Normans suffer from infighting and problems with the Holy Roman Empire. The rule of Robert Giscard and his likely successor, his son Bohemond, would see a partially successful attempt of centralizing the divided Norman holdings. However, true unity would only be achieved under the rule of Roger II, son of Roger I, brother of Giscard. In our timeline, this Norman ruler successfully centralized the Norman kingdom by promoting religious tolerance, cleverly using diplomacy and surrounding himself with competent and loyal advisors, Roger unified his kingdom in real history and there's no reason to believe that he would not do the same in this timeline. The only issue here is that Roger's cousin Bohemond would still be in Italy and would likely present an additional challenge to the young Sicilian prince. Though not much, as Bohemond's holdings in Italy were not that large because of his father's second marriage. In our timeline, Bohemond embarked on the First Crusade, where he successfully conquered the city of Antioch and became its ruler. Bohemond died when Roger II was still a teenager and for the sake of the scenario we will assume that this happens in this alternative timeline as well. And thus Roger eventually becomes the sole 
ruler of southern Italy, Sicily and Greece, the new Norman ruler would begin planning a siege on Constantinople. By promising the Venetian Republic extensive trading rights and several Aegean islands, Roger would be assisted by a massive Venetian fleet. And so, somewhere around 1130, Constantinople falls to the Normans. Norman expansion would continue in full motion in the following years, first in western Anatolia and then northwards towards Bulgaria. In our timeline, Roger managed to annex Tunisia in the 1140s and would do so in this timeline as well. And so, the Normans would come to rule over a massive Mediterranean realm, encompassing two of the largest cities in Europe at the time, Palermo and Constantinople. Byzantine resistance would continue, however, the Normans would likely fail to conquer the region of Pontus, where a Byzantine Rome state would be formed around the city of Trebizond. Following Roger's death, the Norman holdings in Greece and Anatolia would begin contracting as more Greek Rome states would secede. However, I can still see the Normans keeping most of their eastern possessions, especially the ones in Anatolia. They would still lose Africa to the Al Muhat dynasty, however. The future Norman kings would instead focus on further expansion in Italy. Following their conquest of Constantinople, the Norman rulers would likely claim the title of Roman Emperor, which would likely lead to a confrontation with the Holy Roman Empire. Being a lot more powerful in this timeline, the Normans would conquer all of northern Italy and install a pro Roman pope as they tried doing before. And first, starting from mere mercenaries, the former Norsemen would have risen to the highest rank in the Christian world, emperors of Rome. Italy would be unified for the first time since Justinian's reconquest in the 6th century. This new Roman Empire will without doubt be the strongest state in Europe. With the Greek resistance and the later arrival of the Mongols, the Normans would likely lose their eastern provinces. The even greater division in the Balkans in this timeline would still likely lead to a future Turkish subjugation of the region. With the lack of any crusades in this timeline, the new Roman Empire would shift its aim to the Muslim powers in the Maghreb, conquering northern Africa once again while the Spaniards reconquered the Iberian Peninsula. And first, despite losing their eastern holdings, the Italians would remain a major player in the western Mediterranean and later in the colonization of the New World. Special thanks to my patrons who make these videos possible. If you wish to support the channel financially, you can do so on Patreon. I'll see you in the next one.